So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Julia. Thank you, Mona, because uh, uh, you did a very, very nice work. Uh, your database is unique and your uh, results are very interesting. So uh, uh, it is a pleasure to discuss this, uh, this, uh, this very nice report. So uh, just to Actually, when I have to talk about uh, tax seven, I, I, I like to start with a few very simple statistics. Uh, tax seven is about 1% of the world population, depending on the list, of course, but it is about 1% of the population. But uh, tax seven are rich countries, so they represent about 2% of the world GDP. But in your report, uh, you show that. Uh, uh, depending on the, of the year, uh, depending on the, of the measure, but it is more than 10% of the uh, bank turnover, and it is sometimes more than 20% of the bank profit. So, it, of course, it, it is huge and disproportionate. So, there is clearly a problem. There is clearly, a, as uh, we said, usually there is a, an elephant in the room. So, the, 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 the the diagnostic is very, very clear, uh, thanks to, to your uh, work and thanks to your statistics. So the question now is to, is to understand what can we do? What can we do uh, given this situation? And to answer this question, uh, we have uh, three uh, very, uh, uh, very good experts, uh, one researcher, a member of the European Parliament, and a, and a specialist in financial regulation. So let me introduce them a little bit and uh, then uh, we can discuss about the solution. Um, so first, uh, uh, first Manon Aubry. Manon Aubry is co-chair of the left group in the European Parliament, and she's a co-founder of the intergroup on the Green New Deal. Uh, she lectures uh, at Sciences Po Paris, but uh, in particular, she has worked a lot about uh, Tax 7 when uh, she was a researcher for Oxman France. And uh, she knows very well the country by country reporting because, because she, was, uh, she was one of the first to use the, such database. So we will have uh, Manon Aubry with, with us. Uh, we will have also Anne Laure Delat. Anne Laure Delat uh, is a researcher. Uh, she's associated uh, to the CNRS and to uh, the University Paris Dauphine. She's also a research, research affiliate at the CEPR. And uh, she, she's a very well-known researcher. She has been a member of the Conseil d'Analyse Économique, which is a, an advisory body reporting to the French Prime Minister. So uh, she's working uh, about uh, uh, financial on financial regulation on tax haven, and she's also a wonderful co-author. And uh, lastly, uh, we will have uh, Thierry Filippona. Thierry Filippona is also uh, very well known. Uh, he founded uh, the NGO Finance Watch in, in Brussels uh, just after the, the crisis in 2011. And uh, he managed uh, Finance Watch until two, uh, 2014, I guess. Okay. And, yes. uh, and then uh, he, he was chairman of the, of the French Sustainable Investment Forum uh, and director of the think tanks in France, uh, Institut Fre uh, Friedland. And now, uh, uh, for two years, uh, he was appointed as uh, head of research and advocacy at Finance Watch. So we have a, a, a very nice panel. Uh, each uh, participant will uh, have uh, 10 minutes to discuss the report and uh, to provide maybe some, some solution um, uh, about tax seven. So uh, the floor is yours. Just maybe w one point. Uh, if uh, anybody has a, a comment, you can do it with the chat. But uh, we will uh, uh, we will keep uh, all the questions, the comment uh, after the uh, after the panel. Okay. Is it okay for, for for everybody? Okay. So maybe Manon, you can uh, you can start if you if you. Agree. All right. I can do it. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Gunther, and thanks uh, everyone for, for the great work. Thanks right? in particular to, to the Tax Observatory to have carried on uh, the, the work on analyzing those data, as Gunther mentioned. Um, 
I was uh, among <laughs> the first ones to try to dig uh, into, into this data because uh, you, you, it's not very well, well known, but uh, the data on banks actually has been available in France first. It was back in 2015. I think, um, and then there was the, the implementation of the um, CRD4 directive, and then we had the data for uh, the, uh, all of the European banks. We did, uh, so in my previous hat, when, uh, before being elected at the parliament, I was working for the NGO Oxfam, and I was uh, a researcher uh, and, and campaigner on tax justice. So, um, and in that occasion, we've been analyzing uh, the, the first batch of data that was published, and uh, we published a report that is called Opening the Vote. I, I, I mention it because it's interesting to compare the data uh, with the ones that are published by um, the observatory today, and especially things that uh, see that mostly things have not changed. Uh, and I think that's the, the main results. Um, first, one quick word on data collection. Uh, this has been quickly mentioned. I, I don't remember uh, who did mention it, but um, this might sound like something, you know, on the side that we say it's hard to collect the data, but it's a big issue, actually, because if you want to have transparency, well, then the data have to be used and haven't done that experience. And at the time, I was already in touch with anne and Gunther, and I remember anne being like, really, is it that difficult to collect the data? Well, you have to imagine that you have to go to every single um, uh, a bank's uh, um, website, that it's at different places for each single bank. Sometimes it's way, very well hidden. For some banks, you even have to request it. It's of course not in an open data. It's all in different formats. And um, so the first thing to say is that they should be an EU database for those data because the work and the time that the observatory um, has spent actually should, should not be spent by researcher and this should be available. So that's, I think, one of the lessons learned. On the content of uh, the data, um, uh, the, as, as it's been said, the proportion is, is quite similar, is a fourth of the profits that are booked in tax savings at the time when we did our report. So it was published in 2017, I believe, but you can Google it. Um, there was a, a fourth of profits in tax savings and 7% of employees. So you can already uh, see the difference. Uh, similar trends in terms of uh, what you call profitability, so the profits per employee. We did another, um, at the time, another uh, data that maybe is useful is to compare uh, the turnover with the profit. And we could see that for a number of countries and a number of banks, actually the profits that were booked in tax savings were um, bigger than the turnover, meaning that, which is, which is obviously impossible if you ask any company, if you do one euro or a hundred euros of turnover, you cannot make more profits because you have costs. So it means that obviously the profits have been artificially shifted to tax havens. So I think it's one indicator that is pretty useful as well uh, to uh, measure when we want to know uh, uh, about uh, uh, banks' activities in tax havens. I'm not going to go uh, into more details about the result because I think they were uh, well presented. But again, it's interesting to compare the trends to see also whether countries where there are profits with no employees at all. So there are a lot of odd situation uh, like uh, this one. I remember as well, there was the case of uh, 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 profits in, in, in Luxembourg that were above Germany, UK and, Swe and Sweden uh, combined. So all together, which obviously is very weird. But the question for us is like, what are the political lessons, uh, especially now wearing my hat uh, here sitting in the European Parliament where I am right now, I'm also sitting in the Fisk Committee that deals with tax matters uh, that has been uh, created uh, right after the numerous uh, tax scandals. Um, for me, there are, I would say, three main political lessons and I'll try to be short on those ones not to exceed my time. The first one is obvious, and it's been said already, is that public CBCR, so country by country reporting, tax transparency, in other words, is useful, is necessary. And it's the first step to fight tax dodging is to know what's going on. We've seen how useful it is for banks, but we're still struggling to get it for all multinationals. For years here in the European Parliament, we've been fighting to get it extended to all companies. There's been a deal set at European level on the directive for all multinationals on top of banks, but, and, and there's a big but, 
under the influence of big lobbies, including uh, the MEDEF in France, uh, because France has been copying and pasting their position on, on the MEDEF, the transparency will be limited. So for, for multinational, the rest of the multinational, the agreement is that it will be disaggregated data for EU countries and the EU list of tax havens. As you may know, it only includes a few countries and not the real tax havens. And it will, it will be aggregated data for the rest of the world, which obviously makes it very hard to do the exercise that has been done by the EU tax observatory, observatory like the profitability, so the profits per employee, as long as you don't have data for each single country, you can't make this kind of comparison. So for me, it's a call for a need for disaggregation of those data. And on that matter, the, the agreement has been set in trilogue at the European level is very disappointed. I've been sitting in a room, sitting um, in the negotiation, and I wish the EU tax observatory would have been there to explain them that it's not like a theoretical issue, but it's like in practice, we would need uh, disaggregated uh, data. The second lesson learned for me is that obviously we need a minimum corporate tax rate at the international level and the 15% agreement is definitely not enough um, um, because uh, you can see the difference in terms of tax collection between the 15% and potentially 21% that Joe Biden has been pushing for or even 25% that is the one uh, we've been uh, uh, calling for. Um, and third uh, lesson learned for me is, you know, as an activist on tax justice, I'm, and I'm sure I'm not the only one around the table here, I've been fighting against tax seven for years. We've been all fighting for tax transparency. That is only the very first step uh, of the fight, fighting to get a proper list of tax seven. By the way, it's interesting to see that the EU tax advisory had to make their own list of tax seven because there's no commonly used credible list of tax havens. So they ended up creating their own list with a minimum effective tax rate below 15%. So of course, those are very important steps. And I, and, um, I think we do really need a proper list of tax havens. But I, am, I, I came to the conclusion that we need first movers. We need countries that take on the leadership on fighting tax dodging and tax havens. And there are solutions for this. And one of the solution is obviously what has been presented that is called the tax deficit. I would go a little bit further, uh, what I would call in French, uh, l'impôt universel. Um, uh, so it doesn't have a real translation, so sorry for, for non-French speakers. Um, but with, with the principle that one country can um, uh, calculate for, for, for uh, every single companies how much they should be paying uh, in, in each country and collect the difference between what the company is paying in tax havens and what the company uh, is effectively uh, paying in each country. The difference I would have with the tax deficit uh, uh, proposal or, or the minimum effective tax rate, even at the international level, I would not limit it uh, for countries um, where the headquarter of the company is to collect the tax deficit. Let's take a concrete Example, let's take BNP Paribas or Société Générale that are French, or let's take Apple that is not a French company. And I think in France, it only pays uh, about 19 million of euros of tax, which is obviously not much given the activity that it has in France. And then we could calculate uh, the tax deficit of uh, Apple. Um, and with the, um, the, 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 the tax that they're paying uh, globally, and we, we look at their profits and we, we apply, let's say, 25% rate to calculate how much they should be paying tax, how much taxes they should be, be paying globally. And then we, we should take the part of this tax deficit uh, that should belong to France. Uh, for example, if Apple is doing 10% of their uh, sales in France, then they would take 10% uh, of their tax uh, deficit of Apple. It's, um, it's along the lines of what has been presented on tax deficit, but I think it's really interesting because I see the potential of creating a sort of virtual cycle. Instead of being into the vicious cycle in which we're for years now of lowering the corporate tax rate, a race to the bottom on the corporate tax rate that has been 
divided by two in uh, since the 80s, I think, or in the last 20 years, uh, someone can correct me. Um, so it's it, we should we can we have the potential to stop this even if we don't have the agreement of all countries. Of course, this is what we should aim for. This should be our objective, but. We, we, we can start with one country being France or being any other country that could then, you know, incitate other countries to, to, to follow uh, the trends. And thanks to the EU Tax Observatory Simulator, I would really promote it and, and thanks the work that you've been doing on this because we can measure and calculate how much uh, this type of new um, of new tax would uh, would collect, and for example, for France, if it, it does implement it with a 25% rate, uh, this will help France uh, to collect 31 billions of uh, euros, and for the EU, it will be 198 billions of euros. Obviously, in the time of an economic crisis, when we're all wondering how to recover from the crisis, uh, this money would be essential to support public services, to support those who are in need and hit the hardest uh, by the crisis. So this would be my main uh, political uh, lessons. And I would thank again the EU Tax Observatory for all of the work that they've been doing. I would say as well for those who are interested in more data uh, geeking, that I think you can find online the, um, uh, the database I was talking about from our previous report uh, uh, for Oxfam that is called Opening the Votes. And it, it's interesting to, to compare the two databases if you want also to see how the trends uh, evolve. And hopefully this, this work that uh, uh, you've been doing will help us here in the European Parliament uh, to get some concrete changes changes both in terms of transparency, as I've been talking about, but also key policy changes, starting with a minimum effective tax rate and the tax deficit. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Manon. Uh, I will leave the floor to Anne We have already a lot of questions, so uh, please, uh, so everybody has 10 minutes and uh, we have already a lot of questions. So anne the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Do you hear me? Fine? Yes, okay. All right, so thank you uh, to the observatory uh, for the kind invitation. I'm super excited to be here. Um, the, the discussion should be really uh, interesting and very documented uh, given the, the panelists. And I have a big disclaimer here. Uh, Gunther uh, very kindly introduced us as an uh, expert, but uh, Gunther is in himself a very fine expert on uh, the topic. And uh, he's a wonderful co-author. Uh, we actually produced a, a, a paper together on, the, on this topic, and I will uh, try and, uh, and illustrate some of the findings of this report with our findings too. Um, so just uh, Gunther could be uh, speaking, uh, and I could be the one uh, moderating uh, the debate, just uh, the disclaimer. So very quickly. Um, so, the, uh, Mona uh, made a very good job. She presented the main findings. So, um, I will just get back to it very quickly. For me, there are two different questions in the, in the report and uh, therefore two different sets of findings. The first one uh, is uh, the descriptive statistics on the presence of European banks in tax havens. Uh, so they ask whether uh, banks, European banks, shift uh, profits artificially to tax havens. And the second question is how much tax revenues government could collect if uh, the minimum global tax was applied on bank profits. And they coined, they coined it uh, tax deficit. Uh, this is uh, exactly what, uh, what they calculate in the second part of the report. Now I will give you my takeaways. On, on each uh, uh, finding. First one, they uh, show that there, there's been a stability of profit shifting since uh, 2014. So despite uh, the implementation of uh, this directive, despite all the pressure of the social, uh, the, the, the civil society on this topic, uh, unfortunately, we observe that profit shifting has been quite steady uh, since 2014. First takeaway. Second, ta second ta takeaway, uh, there is an abnormal proportion, an unexplained proportion of profits, which is booked in low tax countries. 
And third, there is a huge heterogeneity among banks. So uh, don't treat banks uh, the same. Uh, some banks are actually much more aggressive than uh, others. You may notice that I keep no specific figures in my takeaway, and I keep no name of banks. Uh, why is it so? While statistic descriptives are super interesting, but highly debatable, uh, the main reason is that banks can always claim that they booked those profits for a specific motive. And actually, they do. Uh, that's how they, act, they, they, they usually react to uh, this kind of uh, report. And not only banks, but jurisdiction can react very strongly uh, to advocating that the activity is actually totally legit since uh, they have a very strong uh, financial industry in their uh, jurisdiction and, and, and it uh, uh, justifies the large amount of uh, profits uh, and activity which is booked in, uh, in their jurisdictions. Give me just, um, let me give you just an example of uh, uh, a recent reaction like this. Uh, the Luxembourg uh, Ag Agency for Financial Development uh, reacted super strongly last Monday, well, two days ago to uh, the report, uh, it was quite bold um, because they said like uh, uh, the uh, the authors of the report uh, are um, they knew exactly uh, what they wanted to find, so they actually questioned the scientific uh, rigorousness of uh, the report, and they are so bold that uh, uh, they have a, a very problematic comment at the end because it's a it's a federal agency. And they actually ask if the report is worth the European taxpayers' money. Uh, so uh, I see it as a, as a very uh, bold attack on uh, scientific work. Um, the, the point is that we, uh, those uh, statistic descriptives are actually debatable. And uh, because they, they don't account, if you take raw figures, you actually are always uh, vulnerable to this kind of criticism. Like, uh, you know, we, ha we have a very, uh, like Luxembourg is a very important place for custody uh, activity. So that's the reason why banks, all, uh, all banks uh, are coming and making business uh, to, uh, in our uh, jurisdictions. So quickly, uh, with uh, Gunther uh, and uh, Vincent Bouvatier, we actually, uh, uh, use the same figures, uh, but we try to account for countries' characteristics. Uh, and our findings are actually in line with the takeaways of the report, but our figures are hopefully a bit less debatable. So um, very quickly, we find the bank presence in tax events, which is abnormal, uh, but on average, we find uh, that it's twice the predictions uh, and uh, we also uh, observe a strong heterogeneity, but the heterogeneity that we uh, observe is, uh, concerns uh, jurisdictions, the, the countries and not the banks. Uh, banks, we thought that uh, there are too few observations for the banks to make strong conclusions. Uh, as, um, as far as jurisdictions are concerned, uh, we found that Hong Kong, Luxembourg, and, and Singapore are actually concentrating the bulk of the abnormal turnover. So guess why Luxembourg was so uh, reactive last Monday uh, when uh, you published uh, the report. So that was for the first part. And the, the, so the main conclusion is, OK, descriptive statistics are, are great, but be careful to not publish figures that are too debatable and that will weaken your main message, which is super important. The second uh, uh, part concerns tax deficit. And my main takeaway is with the minimum global tax rate, government could collect fiscal revenues. And obviously, the higher this tax rate, the larger fiscal revenues. Again, I don't have figures here. Uh, while I totally understand uh, the importance of figures to, um, to put, uh, I mean, to nourish the, the public debate, again, uh, these figures can be uh, quite debatable. And, and to be honest, we don't know exactly how much uh, revenues we, we could collect. So I'm super happy that those figures go into the public debate. But as uh, an academic, I would be a bit more cautious. 
a reason why uh, for the reason for the, for this uh, being cautious is that uh, they actually in this report they actually combine effective tax rate and statutory tax rates. What does that mean? The minimum tax rate is a statutory tax rate. It means that it's the, the tax rate that uh, countries uh, officially uh, state and report. But we all know that there are so many exemptions and that uh, there are lots of ways to actually reduce the statutory tax rate. So that's why we uh, work with the effective tax rate. The effective tax rate is exact, is, it corresponds much more to the tax that companies will uh, pay at the end. And for example, in France, if you compare, uh, if, if you look at the effective tax rate of banks in France, uh, a figure that uh, Gunther uh, uh, calculated for a, a report uh, a few years ago, banks actually pay little tax in France, even in France, not only in tax haven. So when the minimum tax rate will actually be implemented in, in, uh, in uh, globally, the next frontier will be the battle around those exemptions, around the, 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 the effective tax rate, the global effective tax rate. So, uh, and, and you know, given that some countries, uh, for, the, for some countries, it will be particularly painful, Luxembourg, Singapore, as we found that uh, they concentrate the bulk of activity, uh, we'd be better uh, watch out the way this jurisdiction will circumvent the new institutional regulation and allow exemptions. So this is why I would be more cautious about how much revenues we can collect, but the policy lessons would be, well, uh, let's now focus on these effective tax rates and these exemptions, the way those uh, companies and jurisdictions can circumvent uh, regulation. So in conclusion, why is this report super important? Well, it's not the first one. We, uh, we are very lucky to have Manon uh, around the table, which actually produced the first report uh, using those data. We actually use the data of Manon after in our uh, uh, paper. Um, so th there's been this Oxfam report. There's been the, now there are several academic papers using this data. And I saw quickly a comment of uh, uh, a participant uh, 10 minutes ago saying, well, so if you find uh, stability of profit shifting uh, uh, over the last seven years, so what's the point uh, in uh, the data transparency? Well, um, these, uh, these reports are super important. And uh, unfortunately, one report cannot change the world, but uh, it contributes to um, raising the attention of the civic society on those uh, issues and, and, and simply putting pressure on policymakers, putting them uh, in the agenda and, and also justify and, 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 and making it legit, legit when those policymakers like uh, Manon uh, are uh, um, uh, trying to enforce that in the, in the policy agenda. So uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me the, the floor and I'm happy to uh, get uh, the discussion. Thank you, thank you, Anna. So with no transition, uh, Thierry, what do you have to say about that? And then we will have a lot of questions, maybe more than well, a lot. So Thierry, it's you. Thank you, Gunther. So well, very happy to be here and to be exchanging on, uh, on this topic with you. Um, what I'll try to do is obviously react to the report, but from the, the traditional finance watch angle, which is the policy making angle, which obviously will relate to, you know, one of the dimensions that uh, you asked us to, to, to work on Gunther, which is solutions. And obviously solutions, a uh, big part of the solution is policy making. Um, first of all, I'd like to highlight uh, and, and insist on the importance of and the usefulness of country by country reporting and therefore of the report we're discussing today. Um, this report is really very useful. Of course, you can always discuss this or that on, on the numbers. I'm not the expert on, on determining what the right numbers are, uh, but certainly I know that this is exactly the sort of report we 
collectively in civil society were looking for when, when we advocated for country by country reporting. And if you allow me, there's, there's a point I'd like to make here. I remember very well when I was speaking in, in parliamentary hearings and discussions with different officials here in Brussels um, in, you know, in 2012, 2012, 2013, when, when uh, CRD4 was being finalized, and there was that discussion on country by country reporting. And one of the big arguments of the bank lobby at the time was like, you know, if we do country by country reporting, it's gonna be the end of the world because my, my, my business plans will be transparent and my competitors will be able to copy on me, end of the world, you know, you cannot do that. What I know is that we're now seven years later, eight years later, um, country, by country reporting exists and that has had no negative impact on the business of banks. Uh, the reason why I, I start with this is that, as mentioned previously, there's today a debate by you know, non-bank entities saying you know, country by country reporting would be the end of the world. Well, I, I think you, you can easily guess what I think of that, but I know for a fact that there was a big battle at the time I'm seeing exactly the same arguments on for different segments of, 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 um, of corporations today, but I know that it's, it, it just makes no sense. And this report is, is really what we, we always wanted for. So that's the first point I, I wanted to make. Um, second point is, obviously we're discussing European banks here, but this is far from being only an EU bank question, or as a matter of fact, only a bank question. Uh, and this is the reason why the recent framework, well, the framework on base erosion, er, erosion and profit shifting from the OECD, um, which, which led to the agreement by, by the G, was G7 initially, and then taken by the G20, if I'm not mistaken, uh, basically in, in, in beginning of this summer, uh, is, is so important. Um, uh, as we know, shifting profits to low or no tax locations where there's little or no economic activity or you know, the practice of eroding tax bases through deductible payments such as interest or royalties is a world industry. This is, this is you know, um, universal, I would say. Importantly, most schemes used are not illegal. I'm, I'm not saying they're not some of them are not illegal, but a lot of them are not illegal. So therefore, when we're gonna be thinking about solutions, we have to, to take those parameters into account. Um, the interest of the EU tax observatory report is that it is as much about banks tax optimization profit, uh, practice, sorry, that it is about a question of the minimum tax rate um, that uh, countries should, should impose on, on, on businesses. And obviously, there's a huge policy debate behind that, which is the debate of tax competition between countries. And this is where the OECD G20 inclusive framework on BEPS uh, kicks in. And I'm, I'm going, going to insist a little bit on this because it, it is particularly important. If I may, uh, to put things in perspective, we, we have to, 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 to keep in mind that the agreement at the beginning of the summer was on so-called two pillars. Pillar one was that there should be taxing rights and the taxing rights should be determined by the place where the goods and services are being purchased by customers and not where uh, companies headquarters are located. This is the first pillar. Pillar two um, proposes a new global corporate tax rate at minimum rate of 15% for companies with turnover of more than 500, uh, sorry, 750 million euros. Fine, uh, or dollars is it, it's probably dollars. Uh, something very, very important to bear in mind here is that there was a big loophole in the discussion because the financial, financial services were exempted from pillar one. In other words, what, I just, what they call pillar one is, I, I will repeat because this is very important. It's taxing rights, well, taxes should be should be should happen should take place where business is conducted not where the headquarters of of uh, of, um, of, uh, of, um, of of companies are, are, are located and obviously the fact that there is and, and there is a carve out for financial services on that and this is a big 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 loophole because as 
the EU tax observatory report shows very clearly when it shows uh, the level of profitability per employee, we have a big issue of taxing not where business is being done. So the fact that there was that carve out is, in my view, something really um, not desirable, to put it very politely and very mildly. But you know, with all the support we can bring and we must bring to the agreement that was, uh, that was, that was made by G7 and G20 countries uh, before the summer, at the beginning of the summer, you know, and on top of that, there's a question of what's the right rate, that's the pillar two, and indeed 15% is, is still very low. But beyond that question of the tax rate, the fact that you know, financial services are exempted from that pay your taxes where you do your business rule is something that should be pushed back on. And, uh, and that I think is, is, is absolutely essential if we want uh, this whole uh, process to be, uh, to be effective. So that's really the main points I wanted to make. Um, and obviously, the last question is the definition of, of tax havens. Um, the report is taking a definition, endogenous uh, definition of tax havens. There could be other definitions. But what makes, I find, uh, section four of the report particularly interesting is the fact that it takes precisely, it looks at the effect of a tax rate of, well, it looks at different tax rates, but certainly 15% is of interest, given what I, I just mentioned on the, on the G20 inclusive framework on, on BEPS. Um, so those are, are, are the, big, um, the, big, uh, the big, for me, um, takeaways from the report or reflection it inspires in terms of policy making. But uh, here again, uh, if we want this whole thing to be effective and to improve the situation, we have to be very, very consistent um, in applying the rules to all economic actors, including banks. There's just no, absolutely no reason why there should be a carve out uh, on those agreements uh, for, for, for financial services. Many, many more things to discuss, but conscious of time and knowing that we need to keep the time to debate, I will stop here for the time being and happy to respond to questions. Okay, thank you very much, Thierry. Uh